guys, I'm Laura and you're watching Laura X I. So today I'm here to do my Romeo and Juliet Act 3, the whole of it. So let's get right into this. Scene 1. The sudden fatal violence in the first scene of Act 3, as well as the build up to the fighting, serves as a reminder that for all its emphasis on love, beauty and romance, Romeo and Juliet still takes place in a masculine world in which notions of honour, pride and status are prone to erupt in a fury of conflict. The dramatic tools that Shakespeare employs to make the lover's romance seem even more precious and fragile. Their relationship is the audience's only res respite from the brutal world pressing against their love. The fights between Mercutio and Tybalt and then between Romeo and Tybalt are chaotic. Tybalt kills Mercutio under Romeo's arm and flees and then suddenly and inexplicably returns to fight Romeo who kills him in revenge. Passion outweighs reason at every turn. Romeo's cry, why am fortunes fall, refers specifically to his unluckiness in being forced to kill his new wife's cousin, thereby getting himself banished. It also recalls the sense of fate that hangs over the play that I have talked about a million times in these videos. As I said, fate always is a big player in the play, really. <laughs> Get it? Player in the play. <laughs> uh, that just went flat. <laughs> Mercutio's response to his fate, however, is notable in the ways it diverges from Romeo's response. Romeo blames fate or fortune for what has happened to him. Mercutio curses the Montagues and Capulets. He seems to see people as the cause of his death and gives no credit to any larger force. Now, Mercutio's thing about saying it is a plague of both your houses which is a humongous line in the whole play which foreshadows basically the complete end of the play we know that at the end of the play that Capulets and Montague, spoiler alert, kind of have a truce together but I think that's one of the things that this line by Mercutio kind of tells everybody. Anyway, the arrival of the prince and the angry citizen shifts the focus of the play to a different sort of public sphere. Romeo's killing of Tybalt is marked by rashness and vengeance, uh, characteristics prized by noblemen, but which threaten the public order that citizens desire and the prince has a res responsibility to uphold. As one who has displayed such traits, Romeo is banished from Verona. Earlier, the prince acted to repress the hatred of the Montagues and Capulets in order to preserve public peace. Now, still acting to avert outbreaks of violence, the prince unwittingly acts to thwart the love of Romeo and Juliet. Consequently, with their love censored not only by the Montagues and Capulets, but by the ruler of Rona, Romeo and Juliet's relationship puts Romeo in danger of violent reprisal from both Juliet's kinsmen and the state. So that was scene one. Now on to scenes two through four. The love between Romeo and Juliet, blissful in act two, is tested under dire circumstances as the conflict between their families takes a turn more disastrous than either could have imagined. The respective manners in which the young lovers respond to their imminent separation helps define the essential qualities of their respective characters. After hearing that he's to be exiled, Romeo acts with customary drama. He is grief-stricken and refuses to listen to reason and threatens to kill himself. Juliet, on the other hand, displays significant progress in her development from the simple innocent girl of the first act to the brave, mature and loyal woman of the play's conclusion. Now that is an important thing to note because you would think that in back in Shakespeare time it would be kind of Jul uh, Romeo that would be getting the, the great character arc when in actual fact it's Juliet that's getting the awesome character arc in this and really not Romeo. Juliet grows up in this. Romeo still I think gets grows down and that is a that is a testament to Shakespeare to be ahead of the time in giving women a better character arc than the men do. After criticising Romeo for his role in Tybalt's death and hearing the nurse curse Romeo's name, Juliet regains control of herself and realises that her loyalty must be to her husband rather to than to Tybalt, her cousin. Shakespeare creates an interesting psychological tension in Romeo and Juliet by constantly linking the intensity of young love with a suicidal impulse. Though love is generally the opposite of hatred, violence and death, Shakespeare portrays self analytion and seemingly the only response to the overwhelming emotional experience that being young and in love constitutes. Romeo and Juliet seem to flirt with the idea of death throughout much of the play 
and the possibility of suicide recurs often, foreshadowing the eventual deaths of the lovers in Act 5. When, she, when Juliet misunderstands the nurse and thinks that Romeo is dead, she does not think that he was killed, but that he killed himself. And thinking that Romeo is dead, Juliet quickly decides that she too must die. Her love for Romeo will no, allow no other course of action. Romeo's actual threat of suicide in Friar Lawrence's cell in which he desires to sack the hateful mansion that is his body so that he may eradicate the na his name recalls the balcony scene that we talked about in which Romeo scorns his Montague name in front of Juliet by saying had I it written I would tear the word. In the balcony scene a name seemed to be a simple thing that could he could hold up in front of him and tear. Once torn he could easily live without it. Once again, that's talking about Romeo being, you know, when Juliet was like, swear not by the moon because it's inanimate object. He likes to make grand gestures, but he doesn't realise that that's a load of shite. And that's not what girls want to hear, really shite. Now, with a better understanding of how difficult it is to escape the responsibilities and claims of family loyalty of being a Montague, Romeo modifies his metaphor. No longer does he convince of himself as able to tear his name. Instead, now he wants to rip it up from his body and in the process, die. Capulet's reasons for moving up the date of Juliet's marriage to uh, Paris are not altogether clear, actually. In later scenes, he states that he desires to bring some joy into a sad time and to want to cure Juliet of her deep mourning. Of course, ironically, she mourns her husband's banishment and not Tybalt's death. But it is also possible that he, in this escalating time of strife with the Montagues, Capulet wants all the political help he can get. A marriage between his daughter and Paris, a close kinsman to the prince, remember, would go a long way in this regard. Regardless of Capulet's motivation, his decision makes obvious the powerlessness of women in Verona. Juliet's impotence in this situation is driven home by the irony of Capulet's determination to push the wedding from Wednesday to Thursday when a few days earlier he wanted to postpone the wedding by two years. Now on to scene five. To combat the coming of the light, Juliet attempts once more to change the world through language. She claims the lark is truly a nightingale. Where in the balcony scene Romeo saw Juliet as transforming the night into day, here she is able to transform the day into night. But just as their vows to throw off their names did not succeed in overcoming social intuitions, 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 what, uh, you know what I mean, and <laughs> you know what I mean, and have plagued them, they cannot change time. As fits their characters, it is more pragmatic Juliet who realises that Romeo must leave. He is willing to die simply to remain by her side. In a moment reminiscent of the balcony scene, once outside Romeo bids farewell to Juliet as she stands at her window. Here the lovers experience visions that blatantly foreshadow the end of the play. This is to be the last moment they spend alive in each other's company. When Juliet next sees Romeo, he'll be dead and as she looks out of her window she seems to see him dead already. Oh God. I have an ill-divining soul, methinks I see thee, now thou art so low, as one dead in the bottom of a tomb. Even my eyesight fails, or thou looks pale. In the confrontation with her parents, after Romeo's departure, Juliet shows her full maturity. She dominates the conversation with her mother, who cannot keep up with Juliet's intelligence and therefore has no idea that Juliet is proclaiming her love for Romeo, under the guise of saying just the opposite. Her decision to break from the counsel of her disloyal nurse and in fact to exclude her nurse from any part in her future actions is another step in her development. Having a nurse is a mark of childhood. By abandoning her nurse and upholding her loyalty toward her husband, Juliet steps fully out of girlhood and into womanhood. Shakespeare situates this uh, maturation directly after Juliet's wedding night, linking the idea of development from childhood to adulthood with sexual experience. Indeed, Juliet feels so strong that she defies her father, but in that action, she learns the limit of her power. Strong as she might be, Juliet is still a woman in a male-dominated world. One might think that Juliet should just take her father up in his offer to disown her and go to live with Romeo and Mancha, which would be the smartest idea, but of course this is a tragedy, of course that's not going to happen. That is not an option. Juliet, as a woman, cannot leave society and her father has the right to make her do as he wishes. Though defeated by her father, Juliet does not revert to being a little girl, which is what Romeo almost does. He reverts to being a little boy again. She recognises the limits of her power. 
and if another way cannot be found determines to use it for a woman in Verona who cannot control the direction of her life suicide the brute ability to live or not live that life which also comes up in another Shakespeare play wait for January 2017 for Hamlet so um, can represent the only means of asserting authority over the self. So that was it. Um, join me on Thursday for Greg's character arc. Yay! I will see you guys on Thursday.